Okay, so you can hear me, right? Yeah, man. Okay, well, then we can go, because I seem to be recording, I think. So, we're all good. Um, do you have water and coffee and all that shit, or...? I've got a nice big glass of water here. I'm okay. groovy. Everything's cool. Okay, I guess I'm the only psycho that drinks coffee at 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock in the evening, so... Oh, I would do, but I'll be up pissing at 4 in the morning, mate, but so, I don't, yeah, no. I don't understand no. that. Some people have a real problem with that. I've got a friend who, like... Anything after lunchtime, he's like, no ways, I can't do it. And no, I, I'm, I don't I'm, have... I'm, I'm fine. I think it's more the fact that I'm nearly 50 now and my bladder just can't fucking take it, mate. <laughs> You're nearly 50? <laughs> nearly 50, mate. Oh, I'm 48. Well, I, no, it's exactly 10 years. 10, well, I'm not quite 38 yet. I'm 38 next month. So, okay. you know, it's all just yeah, about... No, you don't... You, you're looking good, mate. You're looking tidy and together. Well, I, no, it. it's only because it's a headshot. You know, we, we're releasing an episode. <laughs> no, honestly, we're releasing an episode on Wednesday that we recorded in person. And because right. the venue was so nice that we had like, um, uh, there's like motorbikes everywhere and it's this kind of industrial um, community garage kind of vibe. And yeah. because of that... Um, we had to have like full body shots and I was like, and the camera angle is terrible and it's really fucking embarrassing. But it is what it is. I've got it. I can't, you know, I can't complain if I'm not doing anything about it. You know, I've got to sort my life out. So. Well, yeah, but yeah, it's one of those, isn't it? There's, there's priorities and there's nice to haves and yeah, things you sometimes get brought up in conversation about. And yeah, no, don't worry about it, mate. Just, just, just do headshots. It's fine. I know, I know, but I, but the thing is, it, it, it is, it is a fucking. It should be a priority. It is a priority because I, um, you know, it's health related. So, you know, if you, if, if, uh, if I'm still, I don't know, if I don't do anything about my weight, then you know, in ten years' time, it's gonna be. <laughs> You'll look like me. <laughs> no, it's gonna be a fucking total disaster. It's gonna be an absolute shit show. Just, just remember this recording because this is this is your watch out right here. This is this is what you're going to look like ten years from now if you're not going to sort your act out. Okay. Your hair's well, going to fall out. Your skin's going to go pale, mate, and then you're fucked. Well, but I don't think my hair's my hair's my. I think my hair's here to stay, but it's, yeah, all right, fuck off. Just rub it in. Why not? <laughs> it's everything else that I'm worried about, Mike. Yeah. Listen, it's an absolute pleasure to finally do this with you. I um. Your name has been thrown about quite a lot back in the day, mostly um, in a positive light. Um, <laughs> mostly. Okay, cool. We'll talk on that one. <laughs> I, I do have a little bit of a bone to pick with you, though, because apparently you were um, the guy that uh, helped a lot of guys out of Coventry with their alias, and uh, I never got to experience that. So okay. I wonder why yeah. that why that wasn't. I, I I was there. I only did it two years. It was, it was two successive years. It was when I was um, freelancing, so it would have been two thousand and nine into two thousand and ten. Right. Where were you? Were you I what well, I what well I graduated in two thousand and nine. So um, right, we may have just missed each other. But yeah, I mean, I was, yeah, I was doing. It was is in theory the sort of industry advisor role, but but practically, you know, you're just walking in the studio and sitting with whoever needs help. And, you know, people are just throwing themselves at you. It's like, just give me, give me something. Look at my folio, look at my alias model, look at whatever. And it, in what sort yeah, of way we, were we, they throwing themselves at you? Uh, not in that way, mate. <laughs> no, but there, there was quite a lot of sort of just people camping out. You know, I'd, I'd get in, I'd come in by train in the morning. And I'd, I'd normally be in the studio by about half eight, quarts nine. And week one, you know, I sort of rocked up and it's just me and people breezed in. But by week two, there was two or three camped out forming a queue. And and by week three, week four, you know, there's just like, oh my God. And, and you just see your whole day just mapped out of just people just desperate for input. And I, I've got to say, it was something we're going to, we're going to talk about, but it's, um, it's a really rewarding thing for me to do, you know, because, because, you know, you're giving something back and you're helping people out. And it's not like, you know, don't get me wrong, I'm not, I don't ever think I'm the best alias pilot in the world, but you're just able to debug the basics, you know, just get people started. Yeah. And you can then see that progress the following week. You know, they come back with a really big smile on their face. Oh, I've done this, I've got this, and this all works now, and I get it. And that's like, 
Yeah, that's great. You know, that's that's what it's about. Yeah. It's, it's really nice. It's really good fun. I think especially with Alias, because it is so fucking unintuitive. I mean, it's it's got to be one of the most unintuitive pro, uh, programs to use. I mean, apart from coding, I th- it's got to yeah. be, it's, it's yeah, it's it's not an easy thing to do. It, it's not. And, and, I, and I always found that the, you know, the, the, the proper full interface is like, what the hell? And, the, and there's, there's always new tools being released and tools move around and stuff happens. But... Yeah, we still joke about it, but I still carry around this little shelf and I, and I kind of give it out for free to anyone that wants it of just you know, your basic spider that's set up the way I like it and your basic shelf at the bottom. And I never go near anything else, you know, and that's me, what, 20 odd years in industry now. You know, There's loads in the software, but to just get data up and running, you, you don't need a lot. And, and you, it's just overwhelming if you're looking at the whole interface in one go. It's horrible. I, absolutely but, horrible but isn't but isn't that this there's a lot to be said for that because i also just i mean i've got the same shelf and it's also because i'm incapable of change um but but it's like you know i basically on a you know ba- I, I pretty much use like you know six or seven tools and that's pretty much it you know it was yeah. but i think in the beginning when you you face with this this massive palette and you think like fuck I need to know how everything works. And it's almost like, yeah. I, I, I swear to God, it was like a competition at one stage. Even when I got into to Jaguar, like some of the modelers were kind of like going like, well, do you know what this does? And do you know what that does? And I'm like, no. Yeah. And I felt really intimidated. But um, yeah. yeah, you just need the skin tool and that's it. Yeah, just skin tool, switch on a few CVs, pull them around a bit and yeah, go and get a coffee. There you go. It's not that hard. Come no. on, I've made a career out of it. It's not, it can't be too difficult. <laughs> well, Mike, where did you learn to use the wonderful software that is Alias? This, this was in my first job. This was because I graduated in 96. Jesus and Christ. Picked, picked up my foot. Yeah, and this was all before. I was five. Yeah, we... we, we <laughs> Shit. We 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 had um, AutoCAD training, I think, in the second year, which was basically five people doing a side view, and that was about as much as CAD as we did on the course. So I, I graduated in '96, and at that point, it's all just good old fashioned analog. And uh, it was the following year that I, I picked up my first job, which was with what was called uh, AdTrans then, which is it's part of it's British Rail Works as it used to be, and it keeps being branded and renamed or whatever. And I was about. A year and a half in there, and um, at that point, even even in, in the studio, everything was sort of hand drawn. You had CAD underlays coming from the engineering team, and you'd be doing, yeah, you know, marker renderings, things over the top of it to design the bits you wanted to on the train. Um, but the, the 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 breakthrough came for me. There, there was talk about getting Alias in the studio, and there was plans to do it in conjunction with VR. But what happened was, I ended up going out to Berlin and working. With, with the same company, but um, on a, a sort of an international rail project in, what was that, early, early 98, I think. And I was there for six, nine months. And they already had Alias running in, in their studios. And, and the, the, the design manager there, Michael Zond, was just really happy to let me sort of jump on after hours and, and just have a play. And he'd sort of give me little bits of tutorials himself you know he's a busy guy but he'd sort of sit me down and show me the basics and I was making spaceships out of ellipses at that point and just sort of going oh here's a thing I can put that on there and making these things a lot like cocks you know basically you got to silly and do with an ellipse on one yeah, I'm learning English now and I'd sort of take these models home and go look boss I've made a spaceship and he'd be like yeah try harder so so uh, literally over the course of this sort of six nine month period I picked up the absolute basics of just sort of blocking things out and just Organising data, I sort of helping other people organise data and files, things like that, and got my head around the basics. And at, at that point, by the time I came back to the UK in the studio, they'd got it on board. Um, and because I'd had some alias experience, they sort of put me in the first wave of training. So it started with Rob Aldroyd. Rob, Ald- the first time I met Rob, he, he sort of came in the studio and did a couple of days tuition with us. And yeah, that, that's when it began for me. And, and, and it was like a just amazing bit of software for me because. I, yeah, I'd always sort of been interested in sort of 3D, 3D form development, but you know, working in industry at that point, when, when you're sort of handing over sketches, you're handing over 2D ideas, and then you're reliant on, basically at that point, engineering guys to, to do the surfacing, to do the development work, and you wouldn't get what you wanted, you couldn't communicate effectively, you couldn't take control of the data yourself. It was kind of frustrating, and the results were a bit 
weak, you know, it wasn't as strong as the vision should have been as, as far as I was concerned. So suddenly being let loose with a tool where, you know, I can, I can now communicate now and I can get out what I want. You know, I can do data that's used for prototyping, use data that's used for milling. Yeah, that was like this big light bulb moment because, you know, for me, I've, you know, sketching is one thing, but getting it absolutely right in 3D and having something that as an asset you can use within the project is kind of everything. You know, that's for me what design's about. It's, it's being able to sort of communicate and interface and, and get the job done. I I did, I mean, I guess it was like that, but I mean, I remember, um, do you know Harris Mann? Do you know who he is? Yeah, yeah, I know the name. He's 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 proper old school. He's yeah, he goes I mean, back he was, a few years older than me. I I felt a little bit stupid, but like the first time I would heard about him was 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 at Coventry, and apparently he was this British Leyland legend back in the day. And um, he was saying that he learned to clay model for that specific reason. Like he showed us a um, he showed us a sketch that he did. I can't remember right. what it was. It was like an allegro or something like that and it was literally like they would give over a rendering and then kind of you know a volume would come back you know but but yeah. um like a production volume and they yeah. and they shot and he showed that you know the mismatch um between you know what his intentions were and what the final product was and it's like now it's totally obvious like of course it's going to happen especially if you're giving it to people that are um you know uh not creative and yeah yeah and and also i mean you 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 know how how many compromises need to be made when the vision is completely um black and white clear and yeah. um you know you can it's it's obvious that those that those things happen all the time which hmm. i guess now might not be so obvious no and, and it's, it's it's just that whole you know th there's an extra party in the room you know between what you want and what you get and yeah, design is about compromise, you know, and there's a million and one things that will come along along the way. But as long as you're in control of developing the surface in response to that, you know, you can ride those compromises, you can wave it and you can still get something good out of it. You know, it's, it's doable. But if you're always doing it via third party and it's them interpreting it and putting it back into engineering world, I don't think you're ever going to get what you want. And I think you're just going to get immensely frustrated and pissed off. You know, you, you, you want that ability to control it and, and drive it yourself, I, I think. Or certainly for me, that was the case. You yeah, know, it's, it's, ab absolutely. Uh, Mike, sorry, one second. Are you able to move your your uh, comp computer around a little bit? Is that possible or is it... Where do you want me? How, do you oh, want like that, like perfect. Yeah, just just yeah. so that you're in the center of the, the shot. I know you wanted those fancy cars in the background, but they're still yeah. there. They're cool. I can yeah. do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're cool. You. So, um, Mike, what, I, tell me. You said that you you went to go and study car design, but you didn't. But you knew before you started that you didn't want to be a car designer. Yeah. Can well, you, no. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Can yeah, you yeah, elaborate yeah, okay. on that? Yeah. Okay. So. You, Going back to when I was tiny, I was a kid, uh, I was always playing with Lego, I was always sketching stuff, I was always doing blueprints of fantastic vehicles, sort of top-down views, elevations. You know. So I knew I wanted to do something in transportation, do something in design. I didn't really know what, and it was purely by accident, by chance, really. I We did a placement with when we were still at school, this is sort of pre-GCSE final year, where you sort of go out and you do a week in industry with a local company. And I, I got lucky because my dad's my dad was a development engineer there, but I got to go to JCB and um, sort of big construction machinery manufacturer really close close to us. And over the course of the week, I moved through different departments. I think I had a day in technical publishing, you know, looking at how they do build manuals and stuff for how to use your digger. And I did a couple of days with the sales and marketing team, sort of looking at you know doing graphic design and poster layouts and all this kind of thing. And it was literally, I think it was on the last day of that week um, that they said, well, you can go and talk to, to these guys that do industrial design. And I'm like, what the hell is industrial design? I thought that was like designing machines or something, you know, something for the shop floor. And I basically got shown into this little sort of corner of, of JCB. It's a big open plan office, but there's a couple of guys there with drawing boards. But on it, they've, they've just got, you know, I'm belittling their craft, but yeah, they've got a big black marker. They've got a big yellow marker. And they're just fucking going for it. And it's like, oh my God, you know, they're just drawing all the things properly that I kind of thought of in my head as a kid. You know, it's like, these guys 
are doing that and I'm in whatever that is I'm in and although it was only that first week you know they they, thankfully both Chris and Gary who are the two guys there took a bit of a shine to me and they sort of said well okay you can come back you know at some point if you want to come in in your own time over your own school holidays Easter whatever come back and we'll you know we'll tell you a bit more we'll show you a bit more and we'll we'll teach you the basics so this is me age really lucky because I was so 12, 13, wow. you know, get, getting that industry insight and getting, getting these guys taking the time to sit me down and, and show me basic marker technique, basic line work, you know, thick and thin line technique, presentation drawing, uh, and, and basic design thinking because, you know, JTB is very much sort of bolted into prototyping to manufacturing. So, you know, we'd be down on the shop floor in their XP areas and we'd be talking to the guys that's cutting the metal to actually make the machine and we'd be talking about well how how are you actually going to make this and he'd be talking through it and then you'd be going back in drawing based on what you can make so you know really early doors I had that kind of insight and it's like well yeah this is this is what I want to do so I I, I at that point I mean I I, I asked I, I said well you know can I just come here and do an apprenticeship you know I, I just this is it I'm happy and and they basically said it's like, well no you, you you've got to go off and get a degree and it's like, okay, right, so where do I go for a degree? And they said, well, we, we went to Coventry, um, which was a, a, notionally a transport design course. It wasn't automotive design, it's transportation design. So it's like, okay, if that's what you do, that's what you do. So I applied there and I applied to Northumbria, but put Coventry as my first choice. But, you know, I knew that the odds of getting in were really slim because it was like, you know, it's always had the reputation, always had the name behind it, but it's like, well, go on, just give it a go. And... Yeah, got lucky, got in and rocked up on day one. It was hilarious. And over the course of that sort of first induction week, they basically sort of keep you all together and there's all sorts of briefings and this and that and the other. And I remember one in particular where um, they decided they were going to go around the entire room, the entire year group. And the teacher said, yeah, give us give us two or three minutes about yourself. And we're going around. It's like, hi, I'm Klaus. I'm, I'm training at Mercedes. I've done this. I'm Oliver. I've done this. I'm Earl. I want to be in transport design. And I've worked at Rover. And, blah, blah, blah. and we get to me and I'm like, oh, I, I'm, I'm Mike Turner. And uh, yeah. And I'm I an alcoholic. And, I, and I'm an alcoholic. You know, that, came, that came later, but very quickly. And I was like, hi, I'm Mike Turner. I, I, well, I want to do transport design. I don't really want to do cars. And, and I remember at that point, one of the senior lecturers, and I'm not going to drop a minute because I'm not, not going to name names, but he actually stopped things and just went, oh, hang on, whoop. So st- stop me talking in front of the, the entire year group. He says, so you've come to Coventry and you don't want to do car design. What are you doing here? And I was like, all right, okay. And I was like... Jesus. Lies drawn. It's like, yeah, fucking okay. He, he, was, he was very much in the automotive corner, but it's kind of like, yeah, there's a, there's a hell of a lot of fucking bias here. That's Alan's a savage. Interesting. Right? What? Yeah. And I was like, ah, okay. I thought the core syllabus says transport design, right? You know, there's modules about all sorts on this. And I know, obviously, it's pumping great car designers out there, but it was being sold to me as a transport design course. And I'm like, well, I'm coming here because I want to do transport. Yeah. yeah, I want to do. I want to do a bit of all of it, not just straight into car world. So, yeah, so that put that put me in a different camp, and I and I very quickly found over the course of my time at Cof that I tended, as a result of that, to side with the product design guys. You know, just mentally, conversationally, and socially, just seemed to naturally align more with them. You know, there was little car cliques, there was little groups of guys that were obviously, you yeah, know, really close and into it. And don't get me wrong, I love I love cars, but I, I didn't want to just lose myself in in that world specifically so i kind of yeah sort of i was sat on the fence and just sort of watched all this going on and watched all these little cliques emerging and just sort of stayed going i'm gonna just do broad transport with a obviously sort of product design kind of mindset really i guess it's so funny because when we were there it was kind of like you had to earn you had to earn the right to do car design almost i mean it was and and by you know by these masters of 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 car design so to speak or self-proclaimed masters at least and um they i mean like i wonder if there was the course structured the same way when you were there because we had to we had to do in the first i don't know i would say at least for the first year but it was kind of like the first couple of years you had to do everybody was doing like a, a range of different things like whether it be like a bit of industrial design product design and um 
all sorts of stuff, but we were kind of, um, yeah, almost discouraged from doing cars in the beginning, you know. To- yeah, I, th- th- there was a certain amount of that because, because obviously our first year for us, I don't know if it's the same for your year, it was, it was, a, it was a four-year course, obviously the third year in industry. And the yes. first year was all about basics. So it was workshop basics. It was drafting basics. It was form development basics. It was... I think we even touched on aerodynamics, or I don't know if that came into the second year. Yeah, but yeah there was a lot of just modules that were obviously pointing towards things, but they weren't specifically going, right, we're getting into cars now or, or anything particular. So there was that general grounding. And then I think by the end of the first year, there was there was the first kind of product, the first briefs that came out, and you had a choice of about three or four, but most of those were cars, and you had to struggle to find the brief that wasn't about drawing a car. So I did, yeah. always went for the brief that wasn't drawing a car. Which always went down well. How many people were in your year, Mike? I oh, mate, I can't remember. I was I was thinking about this. But are we, we talking like are we talking like thirty or are we talking like a hundred? No, no. It, 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 I suspect it must have been about eighty and ninety. I, I suspect. Okay. Um, I can't remember for sure. It's a long time ago. But I, you know, I remember you know at that point when the conversation stops and everyone in the room was looking at me going. Why are you here? Oh, like Jesus, there were a lot of eyes okay. on me. There was a lot of eyes on me on that day. But but over the course of the first year, there was a there was a lot of sort of whittling out and sorting out. You know, there, there were people that didn't make it through. They, they didn't sort of keep everyone going. You know, there was assessments. People dropped out of the course, and the numbers did kind of come down to more of a sort of close knit thing as, as we got you know into sort of second year and then third year placement. Yeah, a lot of people. I mean, a lot of people kind of. Oh, they either get booted out or they fell by the wayside. And the thing that was very surprising for me is that there were quite a lot of students that were there just because they were like, "Yeah, I'm just doing this because I, I didn't know what I wanted to do, so I thought I'd just get a degree." And I was like, yeah. "You probably chose the most fucking useless degree in the world." Yeah, and and, and I don't know how they'd have got in because you know. It, it was hard for, you know, you, you knew even back then that, you know, there, there weren't that many places you could do this course. And if you wanted to be on the course, you had to be pretty committed. And the, and the, the lecturers were pretty good at making that clear. So, yeah. yeah, weird that people would just turn up and go, give it a go. I don't know. <laughs> I think, but, yeah. I, I think like, I don't want to, again, I, I, I don't want to hate on anybody there now, but I, I think what's, what's happened over the years, and it's not necessarily the lecturer's fault, but... They, the courses got a lot bigger. And um, when I was there, there was at least, in our first year, I'm, there was at least 150 people in total. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, maybe yeah. I it could have even been more. It felt like more. And, yeah. um, um, but, I, this is a, but that's not necessarily some, anything to do with the people in the faculty. It's, it's to do no, with the... No, I, I think the, it's just it's university policy, isn't it? You know, they, these things are there to, to make money, you know. And I, I found that, you know, go, going back as a, as a visiting lecturer of, you know, having that experience of going back in, in say, 2009, you know, that you were still aware that the, the, the sort of the third and final year groups were enormous. You know, there's a huge amount of people there. And if we're being really cruel about it, there were people there that just shouldn't have been. Yeah, you know, absolutely. That, that, that really weren't capable at all. You know, that couldn't draw, that couldn't think, that couldn't articulate, that couldn't communicate. And it's like, well... It sounds like me. Okay, it's, it's nice. No, 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 you're all right. But, you know, it's like, okay, I understand you've got to give everyone a chance, and this, that, you know, but, but if you're perpetuating this sense that there's something for you when you get to the end of the conveyor belt, someone really ought to just do the decent thing and let you know. It's like, mate, you are not going to get a job in car design. Well, you're not good enough. You're no, really not good enough. No, a hundred percent. And the thing is, it's 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 not only it's not only ruining the course, but it's doing those individuals a huge disservice as well. It's yeah. it's a, doing them such a fucking huge disservice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 it was difficult in that respect for me because you know you you go in there and like I was only in there a day a week, but you'd have what eight eight and a half nine hours to devote to that year group. And you're mindful that you're devoting a chunk of that time to people where it's just going all the way through and out the other side. And these really hungry guys queuing up that, you know, you're you know, being callous about it, but it's like, we'd be better off just focusing on you, mate, because yeah. that was a waste of 10 minutes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Talking yeah. to you, that was like, 
<laughs> no, but I don't. I don't think there's anything cruel about that. I think that's. I think that's totally just. You know, you're not. You're not talking to. I mean, a child. I mean, I know. You know, you are for all intents and purposes still very young, and probably still there's a lot of people that are like. You know, th- this is literally their first time away from mom and dad, and they uh, and they're very naive. But at the same time, there are people that have made big sacrifices to be there. And yeah. if they are there wanting to soak up every last drop of what it is that you've got to offer as a professional, then mm-hmm. you know there's nothing wrong with, with saying, well, Frank, clearly you don't give a shit. So yeah. I'm going to spend my time with John over here, who yeah, is really yeah. interested in what I have to say. Yeah. Yeah. Tricky, mate. Tricky. But Difficult. So one. how did you... Sorry, I know. How exactly did you get into um, teaching at Coventry? That I can't quite remember. I think it was it was John Owen. Did you remember? John was there when John you were there, Owen. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 He, well, I'd, I'd got been in contact with him on LinkedIn years before, just on and off, and just happy birthday, John, whatever. Da, 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 da. Yeah. And we've maintained a bit of a dialogue, and he sort of monitored and sort of was knew where I'd been and where I was going. And he knew I was back in the UK at that point. And he was like, well, would you be interested in coming in and doing some hourly paid lecturing? Would you, would you be that voice from industry? Because you can tell them things that we've been saying all along, but they won't listen to us. Right. You know, coming straight from industry rather than academia, you know, yes. they'll, they'll take it. And I was like, well, yeah, okay, we'll give it a go. And at, at that point, I was really nervous because I was like, well, I, I, don't know, I don't know, you know, if in a one-on-one basis... Because notion it was alias support, but but in reality it was everything. You know, it was sort of folio development, artworking, getting the concept together for what your project was about. You know, making sure it's robust when you're taking it to marking, so that you're covering all your bases. So it was it was coaching. It was it was all it was the whole lot really. Um, and yeah, it, it came about, and and I did it did it for for the first year, and John was just like, well, yeah, please come back, just do it again, do it again next year. What did you have to do in terms of like preparing for lessons? Nothing. You just turn up. You you, you can't. You know, I did I did I did a a death by PowerPoint at the start of it to just put in context the kind of background I'd had and what I knew. Just just so that anyone wanting to then tap into me could go, well, what about this? What about that? If there was stuff that resonated with them. But each day you just turn up and you go, right, what have we got? What have we got? And just bring us bring us your data, bring us you've got whatever we got, and you know you sort of go. 20 minute blocks with, with each person and, and you could have spent all day with each guy right. but you know you were mindful yes. it's like there's there's loads of people wanting help and right. invariably you'd be lucky if you if you I, I never I never ever caught the train home that I planned to catch you know sometimes you stay in there another hour another hour and a half and you, you're happy to do it you know you really enjoy it you get a massive buzz out of it because you're getting something out of it by helping them and they're obviously getting a lot out of it by having yeah. that, that voice from industry that external perspective so yeah it was really good, really enjoyable. I honestly, I, I mean, I if I think if I was in if I was in Coventry now, I would probably I'd probably go and do it. I mean, if that's if they would that's if they would have me, of course. But I think I think I think I would get a lot out of it, and I th- um, yeah. and I can see why people do it, you know. And I think yeah. it's 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 something that for me was really missing when I was there. You know, we didn't really have we had very little of that. I have to say, like without you know being negative. Um, yeah. We didn't have nearly enough of that, um, so I, it's something that I, you know, if I was close by, I'd definitely go and do. But especially uh, now, I, because they, hey, do you know how much the fucking fees are now? It's ridiculous. Yeah, I know it's frightening. It's frightening. I mean, I've got, I've got, a, I've got a daughter now that's just doing her final year of A levels and, and looking into uni next year, and, and you're kind Europe. of looking at where we're at Send now, it and to it's Europe. like. Yeah, I think we could do something cute, but uh, yeah, it's frightening. And and you know, this like you said, there's people investing a lot, and yeah, you want to get a lot out of it, which is understandable. So yeah, go mate if you ever get the chance to do it, because I found it helped me in my day job because it made me more conscious that you know sometimes when you're doing design pictures, sometimes when you're sitting down with teams, there's a lot you take for granted, and it's good to step back and just go. Yeah. Right, let's just explain this again. Let's just be sure everyone's got what we're talking about here. And I think it just helps. I think the more the more you do with this kind of stuff, the more you sort of mix your roll up, the more skills kind of transfer and cross fertilize and just just help help you, just make you more more well rounded. So yeah, do it, mate. You'd love it. 
I mean, I, I say that as if I've got um, a bunch of um, <laughs> messages in my inbox asking me to come and teach. But but get yourself over uh, here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. We but well, obviously we're not there anyway. But I, I've I've heard this a lot before, you know, because um, you always have at least I I have this thing of like you know you you never feel qualified enough, you know, and and yeah. um, you think yeah, yeah. well, you know, I'm not the fucking expert, whatever the case is, but. Um, there's a lot to be said for you. You completely overlook how much you do know, and yeah. how invaluable yeah, yeah. how invaluable that that even a conversation is could be Ooh. with uh, with students. So yeah. it's um yeah it's it's something that I would uh, yeah I would probably if the right opportunity presented itself I would definitely consider it. But I've heard I've heard that before, Mike. Like where they say um the 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 importance of teaching, how, how it not only it gives you something back emotionally, but also it does make you better at what you do because it helps you get clear in your head about whatever yeah. it is that you do, what it, yeah. regardless yeah, yeah, yeah. of what discipline it is. Yeah. Um, Mike, what, can you tell me a little bit about your first job? Yeah. Um, you so you touched on it already. Was that yeah, your? Yeah, 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 yeah. We we because because I graduated in ninety seven and um, all the way through, I I thought I was going to be lucky and get to go back to JCB. You know that was the original plan. That was the original script. But in the course of the final two years of my degree, the the design manager there um, basically said, "I want to move on. I want to go and do something different." And the the guy that he got in, who was a, a sort of more junior guy, just just set, set from what I gather, just didn't have the confidence, wasn't comfortable with with finding his own place in that role and taking on board a junior at the same time. So he was like, so he met with me and we, we had a really good chat. But he, at the end of it, he said, like, I just don't think I can take you on. Um, so that kind of put me in a bit of a tells me, not because I thought I just I was on this easy ticket but it's like oh, what the hell do I do now you know because I've already burnt all my bridges with the car guys you know <laughs> so it's like where, where am I going now and, and, and I had a tough time with it because I as well as that my, my folks had moved they were at the time that I started my course slap bang in the Midlands so really central really good for getting jobs but my dad's job had changed and he moved out to the Welsh borders lovely part of the world but fucking dead for trying to find a job of any description other than the, the closest I found was um, a company that made climbing frames and they wanted a design engineer. And I'm like, um, could try it. Um, so it, it took me about about nine months to, to find something that, that was sort of design related. And that was back in the Midlands. And, and I, I did a, a month's worth of, uh, enge- it was literally an engineering apprenticeship doing draftsman work in Grantham. And then got the call from the guy who had been the boss at JCB, who was then working in the rail industry as a contractor, said, yeah, there's a job coming up here if you're interested. And I was like, well, compared to designing climbing frames, yeah, mate, I'm, I'm there. I'm all over it. So um, went for the interview and, yeah, they, they took a chance on me. And I was hugely grateful for that. I mean, trains at that point wasn't something I was specifically hot on my list to do, but it, but it fitted that mantle of well it's it's transport you know it's it's interesting and, and i knew there'd be a lot to the role because it's you know it's really sort of passenger public public transport facing you know a lot of ergonomics work things that i didn't know anything about and very function driven great yeah. yeah exactly you know just a really interesting environment to learn in and just soak it up so so i started there in what april 97 and did th- about three three years there three and a half years and um it was great but it was proper down in the detail nuts and bolts stuff you know there was a mixture of sort of bid work where you're sort of setting up the vision you're interfacing with the the bidding teams and setting up the artwork selling the concepts for you know this was at the time they're doing virgin cross country yeah transport big transport projects like that but and, and the other half of the job was down in the detail of the stuff going down the production line making sure that that came out right making sure that the certification was there making sure that details like the schedule of finish for the entire train was right making sure emergency labels are there for entry and egress and wayfinding and all that kind of stuff. So some of it, yeah, boring, boring, let's say it, boring, but it's the work that needs doing. And it, you know, it's not all about designing the exterior every time, you know, you've got to, you've got to do all of it. And 
for me, yeah, again, just a really useful grounding because it does make you see that there's more to design than being the guy at one end with the massive ego just going, I have drawn this. Go forth. Make my thing. You know, you're down in the detail of, right, now we've got to actually get it done. And that was great. You know, given my, my background, you know, my dad's, my dad's an engineer himself, a mechanical design development engineer. My mum's sort of on the creative side as well. It's just nice role. You know, a good mix. And it, you're used to the practicalities of it. And it stops you getting ideas too above yourself. But all that nuts and bolts learning, you can reapply back into the concept stuff so that the concept is feasible, is ready for production, is focused like that. So yeah, really great environment. Um, so I did three years there and then just was like, okay, I, I now want to go and learn somewhere else. You know, it's like, I felt like I'm, I'm now doing my apprenticeship. I've got to go off and experience things. And the design manager was there saying, well, why are you going? There's a job for life here. And I'm like, don't, I don't want a job for life. Yeah, I'm three years in. I, I, yeah, don't, it sounds very ungrateful, but I, I, I can't just stop now. I, I, I have experienced my first thing. I need to go and experience my second and my third and my fourth and my fifth and just push myself. Just, just go and learn. And, and that's, that's me. That's, that's been the story of my career. It's littered with constantly learning, absorbing, drawing a line under it, moving on, trying something different. How did your dad feel as being the engineer that he is about his son doing something a bit more airy fairy like design? That's an interesting button. Don't press that button. Um, <laughs> Yeah, we never saw eye to eye that much. Um, bit, bit of a weird one. I mean, I think, don't get me wrong, I think he's hugely proud of what I do. But, but at the time growing up and following almost in those footsteps, not, not in as much as, you know, the same profession, but, you know, going to JCB and it's like, oh, you're Will Turner's son. It's like, yeah, yeah, but I'm also me and I'm doing this. Right. Um, it was tricky because obviously he'd, he'd had his own experience of working with designers and, and what he got back from them. And had formed his own strong opinions on that. So here's me going, oh, I want to be a designer too. And he's like, oh, okay, here we go. Uh, you're a lot of just trouble. Yeah. So it's all right. But yeah, I think, I think now we're kind of there because I think I've done enough now and I've, yeah, there's enough, there's enough projects I can just go, done this, done that. And I've done enough different things that, you know, yeah, it's, we're it's all difficult right. to pick up. Okay. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, maybe it is. I don't know. But, but again, coming back to what you were saying, that thing of never quite feeling good enough, never quite feeling on top of it, that imposter syndrome, yeah, that's part and parcel of it because you're always having to learn new stuff and you're always there going, why am I doing this? This is, I'm so out of my depth. But that's kind of good for you. It's very good. Once you have done it, yeah. you, you know, you're like, shit, I've actually done that now. And if I can get through that, I can get through this and I can get to there whatever there is whatever there needs to be next well the really hard thing is when when you face with a period like you said okay you you had this whole plan to go this grand plan to go to um uh jcb and then that fell through and then yeah. i imagine there was a period where you're like fuck what am i gonna do you know you're stuck in the middle of nowhere there yeah. aren't exactly you know a, a load of industrial design jobs even i mean not even transportation design jobs but you kind yeah. of at a loss for things and and in those moments it's very difficult as a young graduate kind of feeling like having the vocabulary to explain to an experienced professional adult that knows yeah, yeah, nothing yeah. about design yeah. what it is that you're going to do and and what um may or may not be relevant for your for your next move it's a i remember like i had the same fucking thing you know it's like 2009 and there was very little around and i was looking at all sorts of shit like i mean there was there was uh the like a, for example there was a job at uh lti london taxi international whatever yeah 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 that yeah. that like okay like that's kind of a pretty logical thing now you might like raise your eyebrows or whatever but at the time that was like um the most yeah that was the most that was the closest thing i could i could find you know i was but i was also looking at other things like um uh yeah like various design engineer jobs as well because i also said he yeah. did the same thing i was like well maybe i could learn that like maybe i could learn katia and whatever and then i'm going yeah. through, like every time i i go through the job description and i'm like 
no fucking way. It's like, I just can't, I, I, even if I wanted to, I couldn't do it, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's, 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 it's really tricky. And there's been, there's been times along the way where you do, you sort of go, should I be giving up? Am I just wasting my time here? You know, is this, is this ever going to come right? And you got to dig deep and, and yeah, you, you have some really dark days and you know, let's don't, let's not kill each other, you know, but th- thankfully, you know, I had supportive friends, you know, I had people that had been on the course with me, you know, some of them had found work quicker, some of them still hadn't found work themselves. And we kind of, you know, you just, you network and you support each other and, and yeah, it's, something does come and sometimes you've got to, yeah, go slightly laterally to find your way in. But, you know, if, if you're determined and you're going to stick with it, You'll be okay. But was it was there any resentment, Mike, towards the guys that did get jobs? No, no. I mean, honestly, there weren't because because I think we'd all been through so much together as a year group. You know, all the egos at the start. You know, there was definitely yeah month month one year one of the course. It's like you know, what a bunch of fucking. fucking it was all like yeah, just in different corners. But by the time we've all gone through it and you've all made it to the final year, and and at some point by that stage everyone's had a meaningful conversation with everyone else and everyone's seen oh. them at the worst and gone through it. And I think we were all, you know, okay, you weren't there sort of, woohoo, well done, yeah. But you were like, yeah, no, fair play. Yeah, they've earned this. Yeah. You know, if it's come up, yeah, yeah, they've yeah. got it. They've yeah. made it happen. And the fact that I haven't probably just goes to show, well, whatever it was they did, well bloody done. Because I know it's not easy for anyone. No, it's not. I mean, I'd be lying if I didn't, if I didn't say that I was resent, resentful of, of quite a few fuckers. Yeah, I was like, that fucking guy doesn't deserve it. But there were guys yeah. that there were guys that did deserve it, you know. So I and I was quite good at recognizing that. Unfortunately, looking back on it now, it's quite obvious to me as well. It was a very difficult time for sure. But I definitely um, personally didn't have the readies you know in my portfolio and it wasn't it wasn't because i was like you know up in the clouds like i love myself i just at the time i didn't have anybody that could kind of go through my work with me that i like i mean i had people that did but everybody's a fucking expert right so like um but i i didn't i didn't have anybody in industry that i could that, that could kind of give me feedback you know especially then where there was nothing yeah, online yeah which yeah. made it so fucking difficult you know yeah and and, and that's to be fair where, where i did get lucky because obviously i knew i knew chris and gary from jcb days shout out to chris and on. gary chris and gary hi yeah they'll be yeah hi chris well, and gary yeah 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 chris died that's a sad other sad story oh, we'll come up. but gary, okay. gary's still here we're okay yeah hi, we're gary. all right Hi, Gary. <laughs> but no, I mean, I got, I was really lucky because, you know, I did have these people looking out for me. And, and obviously they weren't there all the time, but, you know, you could, at a push, call in a favour and just go, can you just go through this with me? What's wrong with this? Yeah, and and yeah. you get some pointers back. But generally, we got, we got to the point where it's like, well, it's, it's watertight. It's fine. You know, what, what's lacking is the opportunity. It's not, it's not on you. You know, you've, you've, you've done the course, you've got your degree, you've got a well-balanced portfolio. It's just yeah. that... Yeah, it's a tough, a tough time to get a job. That the, the, also, you know, the portfolio, the, the the whole portfolio format was so different then as well. Like there was this, I remember this this inherent pressure to have um, what in your mind you thought like I I need to have like you know thirty pages of of X, Y, and Z, and every page needs to be amazing. And I think every page does need to be amazing, but. Yeah. Um, you know, we got so many mixed messages about what a portfolio needs to be, and I think one of the one of the biggest mistakes that I bought into was this notion of you should include some of your shit work so that it shows progression. That yeah, yeah, yeah. is fucking horseshit. I don't. Well, I I think that's bullshit because if somebody opens up a portfolio on that page that you were that you were um, setting up to to show this triumphant arc. They might not look at the second or third, fourth, fifth page. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. I, I like I don't I don't subscribe to that at all, and um, I I could tell you twenty other people that um, are far more accomplished than what I am that would say the exact same thing. Yeah. Um, there was such a such a yeah there was a huge anxiety with regard to like you know this great big piece you know this uh, this. Um, collection of work and for yeah. that reason there was there was so many the, i 
there were so many things I didn't even apply for because I was just like, I know I don't have the work. Like I didn't even bother applying. And in hindsight, it was probably the right thing anyway because I, no, that's not great advice because some people are like, you know, they might not realize that actually they might be good enough. So that's not good advice. I think you should always try. But yeah. um, uh, the point being was that, oh, fuck, I forget. No, I'm rambling now. You, you, wanted, you, wanted, you wanted to show a portfolio that was all just kick-ass stuff and don't worry about showing the arc of development. Yeah. Yes, yes, but no, sorry, that was it. The, po- the point was that, you know, you, I even though... I didn't feel my portfolio was good enough. I'd put a lot of fucking work into it. And for somebody else to come along and say like, this is shit, that shit, that shit, that shit, that shit. Um, Not that anybody did that. But, you know, for somebody to tell me at that time, like, even if they said it nicely, Sam, you know, you should really consider it you know, redoing everything and everything, or actually this page is quite nice. They should all be to this sort of level. Mm. Um, the mental energy to then go, I need to redo everything to that standard yeah, is, is yeah, unfathomable, yeah. you know? So I, um, I, I, I yeah. And I, and I think at the time that certainly I was doing it and, and maybe crossing over to when you, you were playing with yours, you know, a lot of it wasn't digital, you know, it's, it's proper all just hand drawn one off yes. stuff. Yeah. So for someone to come along and just go, it's like, oh, oh, oh. Oh, no. you know, it's, it, it's, it's, yeah, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work to pull a photo together. I mean, it still is, don't get me wrong, just because no, you're digital, still, it doesn't mean say you, you no. can just piss it out. And it's, yes. It still takes yeah. a lot of effort to curate and, and refine, so, But I think, yeah. like, what, I think for me, the, the mental block often was this thing of, like, you know, everything, everything has to be, um, Everything has to have a story. It has to have a context. I mean, storytelling is very, very important and it's part of the whole thing. What some yeah. people and including myself got lost in is this, this thing of you, you see it all the time. You know, you open up this, this, this portfolio and there's five pages of market research. It's like, dude, yeah, nobody's yeah. going to fucking read that. No, and you, I fucking hate that. It's, I it's, absolutely hate it's, that. It's so, and it's also, it's, and I, I know, I know why so many so many people do it. It's because they are not comfortable enough in the work itself. There isn't yeah. enough there, so they pad it out with this sh- with the shit that know, nobody I fucking know. reads. And, and what, what I remember, I can remember, but we have, by the time we sort of gone slightly further on in my story, but you know, at, at JCB as the design manager, you know, you, you've got to recruit, you've got to look at portfolios, but. If, if I even opened up a PDF that ran to 70 pages, I'd just be like, fuck's sake, you know, because you'd have this, you'd, you'd have projects that had justification, 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 but, but loads of pages bare, but just really nice graphic design, little icons and a little bit of text here. And you'd be thumbing through saying, you know, just get to the juicy bit, get to the juicy bit. And there'd be about, like I said, 10 pages of this. And then Money a shots, shit design, right? a shit design at the end, one single image of a shit design. You're like, now, yeah. You're not, you're not working here, mate. No, it's fine. No, <laughs> you're no. done. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's like I also, um, I, especially now, you know, there there isn't t- people do not have the time, and they definitely don't oh. have the concentration to go through shit like that. And no. I, um, there's only and 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 I, I think always rather rather too little than 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 too much and, and, and being boring. I mean, there's been one person that has 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 uh has been the exception to the rule that i've seen personally it's my good friend ian kettle who's now working um at tesla and he was um he was one of the fucking guys that used to say say like you know if you've got like he didn't subscribe to this notion of like a portfolio needs to be limited to a certain amount of pieces and he yeah. had a thick fucking portfolio mike i promise you i got anxiety when i looked at this thing like it was like it was thick it was like a fucking book i it was honestly it was like that yeah. and and but i opened it up and everything was fucking pretty good i mean it was yeah. exceptional and i i hated him for it you know but it was the only time that i see <laughs> sorry sorry he doesn't sorry mean that. It's fine. no it's the, it's, the, it's the only time it's 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 one of the only portfolios that 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 i saw that was that long that had that much good yeah. stuff in you know yeah. um which is very impressive but i think in in that case if you if you genuinely have 
that much good work, then you, by all means you should include it. I mean, I guess it also shows shows work ethic. The problem is that it's very difficult to be totally um, objective about it when it's your own work. You know, that's why it is yeah, important yeah, yeah. for for other people to vet it. But just get the right people to vet it, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Hey, we're going to need to crack on. We've we've talked for like fifty two minutes at the minute. And Have we? Yeah. I'm, sorry, I'm, you've got. I'm, a, still, I'm sorry, still on I'm job one. Okay. <laughs> So, okay, right. So, listen, but we listen, ah. we don't have to go through all your fucking jobs, but let's do that, Mike. Sorry, I've just first, first made the it earth about ball, me. Then so the dinosaurs came, uh, and then I went here, and then I did that. And then sorry, it, no, yeah. I'll shut up. Listen, <laughs> let's can yeah. we okay? So, you 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 did you, but you eventually got into JCB. Yeah, I got I got into JCB. This was after the rail industry. I've done, I've done about 18 months sort of in consultancy and wasn't happy there that that didn't work out for me um but at that point gary who was at jcb he'd sort of gone away and come back to jcb um said we need someone in the team we need we need we need someone with alias skills which was great you know it's like okay so they know me and i'm bringing alias skills to the table because at, at that point there was there was two of them in the room it was it was gary and a guy called ashley at that point and again, they had this situation that, you know, we talked about where, yeah, they were doing sketches, they were pushing those out into the engineering environment and what they were getting back wasn't getting them where they wanted to be. And projects were stalling, projects were taking too long, everyone was falling out. We weren't getting to the good stuff. So they wanted someone to come in and fly Alias. They, they got Alias on board, but neither of them had the time to learn it. And they just wanted someone that could just, right, get in, get on, let's let's get it going. Um so that that was about two thousand and two. I joined, and um, yeah, really interesting. Me me being the sort of the grassroots alias guy inside a a, a bigish company, but but being that interface, you know, d- getting data, fixing it, making it right. I mean, at the start, you were sort of inheriting models that had, for the first few months you, that started off in the engineering world that you were having to fix creases and things like that in you because know, the modeling rigor just wasn't there and you sort of working with really heavy UG data with loads of spans in it and having to reparameterize it but but over the course of the first year you know you, you break through that and you get into the bit where yeah we are pure concept definition now we, we are getting the sketches on package we, we're driving it the right way around and um, for me that was great you know it's, it's back to that zone you, you're facilitating you're, you're, you're applying your own skills into the design but you've got a, a guy giving you the sketch you're interpreting that and getting that out the door um how creative know, how creative is it in an environment like that i mean doing what is essentially very very functional objects yeah it's i well it's an interesting one how creative is it what well, it depends what you mean what what you term creative as i mean for for me the process of getting it developed getting it right getting it out the door that that is creative but but, but very much, you know, rather than this sort of indulgent bit where you go and go, right, I'm going to do 15 design studies now, or I'm going to do this, or I'm going to put this on the okay, clay. That's I'm going the to do car this. industry. Yeah, exactly. So you, you know, you're, you're in the world where it's like, well, you're the industrial designer. You've got two weeks to develop the services for this. And at the end of it, that's what's going into production. So it's creative, but it's fast paced. Well, and, and that's and that's great. That's awesome. I mean, I think you know what would be really good somewhere in between those two extremes. Two and a half weeks. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> or three. <laughs> or three. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, well, to be honest, that's yeah, that's where we got it to later on in the story. That we we got that sweet spot where it's about right. But you pushed it to it three. Was, it was no, we got we got a bit more than that. But but yeah, I mean, the nice thing with it was was because it was so fast paced and because JT is just that kind of environment for. For someone wanting to learn about design for manufacture, about, you know, doing the job, having the opportunity to do these projects that go around like that really quickly. One minute you're aliasing it, the next minute it's milled, the next minute someone's productionizing it. Okay, you pick all that up, you're already doing other projects. That sort of circle of learning and putting it back in is so quick. You know, you cover so much ground as a designer from working in that kind of really fast-paced environment. You make mistakes, but you make them quick and you learn from that process so you don't have 200 ball bags come in the room and go like mm, i don't know maybe we can bring that line a bit up or bring it a bit down no, or no. none of that at all wow. none of that at all well you you do have the high level reviews there always was the exec reviews but, but basically you know you're, you're presenting to the top floor the, the senior exec and there's two or three of them 
But you'll be studying, you'll be studying the XP area with, with the machine prototype there. You know, there'll be engineering guys talking about the package. There'll be marketing guys talking about the campaign. There'll be product specialists saying where this fits in versus competition. And you get your three minute pitch to go, done this because of this, because of this, this ties in with that machine, that's from that, this draws from this, da, 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 da. and at the end of it, they go, nah, do it again. Or yeah, you're three. But, but if it was do it again, you would literally be two weeks later presenting the second version. Oh, Jesus. Which is wow. great. Which is awesome. You know, you, you just flat out and it's, it's amazing. You, know, you ain't got time to be scared. You just got to just do it. You know, you can't go away and agonize about it. It's like, okay, what can we get done in two weeks? Where can we get this to? I, I, that, that sounds really cool because it also, it stops you from over fucking thinking everything. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and you don't noodle, you know, and, and it's that thing of, as a designer, going back to, to uni, where, where you're encouraged to do supporting sketches. You know, you, you, half the time you, you get the brief, you go, right, bang, there you go. And they go, but we want to see a bigger spread of ideas. And you'll spend two weeks fucking about drawing something because someone told you to. But most of the time, once you're good at what you do, it's that first sketch. Just get on and do it. Yes. You know, you're trained to be the professional in the room. You're not paid by square meterage of wallpaper. You know, you're there to be the expert, do the job, get out, get on with the next one. So noodling, thinking about it, overthinking about it, like you said, no, doesn't happen, doesn't work. Mike, listen, let's, I want to, uh, can you, can you talk a little bit about <laughs> your, your, your part-time experience? Because you were there back in the fucking heyday. So yeah, I, I'm yeah, quite, yeah, yeah. I'm quite interested to know a little bit about that time. Well, I came, I came out of JCB in, when would it have been? It sort of ended 2007. And by, and by that point, I kind of felt like I'd reached a sort of glass ceiling. You know, I, I got to the point where I, I'm not, it's not right here. I'm not learning here or, or I'm as good as I know how to be, but it's still not working. It's the, the products aren't as good as they should be. So I was like, I've got to, I've got to go and learn again. I've got to go off and, and do something different. And I originally thought I was going to be going to Ford in Australia to, to go and work in their sort of utility trucks division. And that was all sort of signed off and was happening. But I'd, I'd have been going in as a contractor. But at the point at which I'd actually resigned, very convenient, they changed the point scoring system and I could no longer get into Australia. But it's like, oh, fuck it. We're just, we're just going to do it anyway because we want to go and learn something different. So I actually signed up to go to Potsdam as a fallback while all this ironed itself out. But it never got ironed out. So I was there thinking, I'll be at Potsdam for a few months and then I'm going to Australia with my wife and my kid and everything's going to be great. And Potsdam's just an interim thing. But yeah, over the course of the first few months, that all broke down. I'm in Potsdam and it's like, shit, I've got to make this work. Jesus. Awesome. Right, I'm now here. We're now doing this. I've got a wife and a kid back in the UK. I'm in Potsdam. Right, okay. Um, but Potsdam itself was, yeah, amazing. And a, an amazing place. For, by the sounds of it, an amazing time. You know, you were just, you were just aware. I think Daniel Simon had, had basically just done his mic drop and walked out of the building and gone, right, I'm now doing this. But his evidence was everywhere. You know, you're sort of in the foyer day one, waiting to be let through into the studio. There's a great big Daniel Simon model just sat in a box and, and that's all there. And then you, you're walking through the studio and you're meeting all these different characters. And you look back now and, and they've all gone on to do absolutely stellar stuff, you know, off the scale, you know, it's as a who's, who's worked where, but I, I was in there, it was, it was only six months. It was, it was originally a six month contract. Um, and I must've worked on about a dozen different things, but, but seems like everyone that I work with has just gone on to do absolutely stellar things. You know, there's who, guys who, like Sash. Yeah. Who were some of the guys? Yeah. Well, I actually wrote down a list because it's like my, my brain's going, so I'm going to just refer to a bit of paper. But at the time that I was there, a few that spring to mind, Andy Hartbaron was there, Max Missioni was there with Thomas Ingenlath, who are, who are now Polestar. They're, boom, up there, done. Um, Sasha, angry car designer guy. I sort of knew him from the blog and sort of meeting him there, it's like, yeah, you, you're fucking ace. And he was obviously fucking ace. And now he's been there, done that. He's Koenigsegg, he's cool. Um, Christian Felsku was there and I was like, you know, wet in my pants because he's in the Daniel Simon book. You know, he's actually there hanging outside of one of the, one of the artworks. And I'm like, going, but you're a, ah. and, I, and I got to work again, got to work with him for a week, very briefly blocking something out and really super cool. It's guys like, uh, Laurent Olivier, who's now at Mercedes. Um, yeah. got to work with him for the best part of three months on a really cool project there, which was, which was mega. And guys like Sasha, Sasha Becker, who's, who's now big inside Audi. He did, amongst other things, he's in the video. If you go on YouTube and you Google the Gran Turismo sport concept that they did, 
he's he's in all the shots as the design guy, sort of going mm, really serious okay. face, lots of beard scratch and all that. So yeah, he's he's there. And yeah, my first my first job morning one of checking in was for Wu Sung Chung, who was on his placement there. And Wu Sung yes, is now with Porsche. Porsche. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And there were loads of others, mate. But like I said, my my brain's shocking. But it was just an amazing time. You know, there was a lot going on, and um, I, I loved it. I mean, don't get me wrong. I I was well out of my depth, and I'm surrounded by really experienced English modelers, and I'm this guy that's come from doing diggers in Staffordshire and, and somehow managed to wing it. And I'm sat there going, shit, shit, I'm going to get fired. I'm going to get fired. I'm going to get fired. And everyone's getting loads of stuff done really, really quickly. And I'm like, how do you model that quickly? And I, I got really lucky because because Eric Scogland, who who ran ran the, the cab team there. Shout had, out had to me, Eric. He's still in charge. Eric! Um, he got me sat next to Jakob, Jakob von Schermeister, who's just, yeah, he's still out there. there. As well, yeah. and, and Jakob's amazing because he's just... He's like Mr. Spock of Alias. He's amazing. He's like this really kind of reserved and distant guy. And I'm there like this chatty English guy sat next to him going, blah, 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 blah. and I'm there going, he fucking hates me. He just wants to get on and work. He just wants to just leave me alone. But over the course of like, yeah, a couple of weeks, this conversation started to flow and it'd be very sort of, yeah, a little bit of this. And he, like, yeah, he'd give me a bit of fruit because he was cutting an apple with his massive knife. Yeah, like, yeah, here's, yeah. A bit, here's, a bit, here's a bit of, here's a bit of apple. And before you know it, it's like, okay. And then it's like, oh, we'll go and get a coffee and you have a little bit of a chat with him. And he was, he's, he's like the opposite of me. He, he knows all about Alias and he knows when not to speak. So, you know, conversations, you'd just be trying to pitch it and get it right with Yakov. But he just taught me so much because the kind of surfacing knowledge he's got just off the scale. And, yeah. You know, you're you're just picking on. How did you do that? Just press that again, and, and it's like you 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 just feed off that, and you you get it off all the guys in the team, and everyone will be helping each other out. And over the course of my time there, my modelling yeah did get a load load better, but it's um yeah mental. I don't think this has been as good since. I think it was just having that environment with everyone around you supporting you. Did you know about the like you know how what a hot spot that was before you went? Not. Really? I mean, that, again, it's this wonderful naivety I've got. I mean, I, I knew that was where, um, obviously Daniel Simon had been and that was like, well, that's interesting. Um, but I, I just, to be honest, if I'm really brutal about it, 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 it was the first job that came up that I could commute to easily from East Midlands Airport and I'd figured out the logistics. So for me getting home to my family nice. of a weekend, I can make this work. And, because it's Potsdam, it's not far from Berlin. And obviously from when I was in the rail industry, I've got friends in Berlin. So it's like, well, I've, there's people there I can see, you know, it already feels like something. It's not, it's not somewhere I don't know. And we, we, we just sort of went out a look at it. We, we actually all flew out as a family over the Christmas holidays in 2008. Blisteringly cold with, with my wife and my daughter and they're all bundled up and they, they stopped for a, a couple of nights, I think. And then they flew home, leaving me there to start my first day in the job. And, as a town, we loved it. We thought it was just super, really, really nice place to be. And uh, yeah, we did it. We- weeks on commuting home, did it for six months. Incredible, Mike. So listen. So after that, what happened? You go back to the UK? Yeah, well, I got. I got they they actually offered me a job. They 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 gave me the chance to stay um, because although I'd not really impressed them, maybe with my aliasing skills, the the fact that I had this interfacing background of working with the engineers, you know, of, of oh, being able to manage projects, manage myself, you know, all the other alias guys would be feeding, working in and out of the team all through Eric and he'd be having to manage that. But for the particular project that I was doing, I did Nils, um, which was little sort of one plus one, yeah. um, little like capsule twi- thing with Laurent. Twizzy kind of thing. Yeah. yeah fantastic. Yeah. I loved it. I mean, that was, that was the making of me, that project and um, love working that with Laurent, but basically Eric just said, well, you can manage the Wolfsburg interface. Just keep, keep your CC'd on what's going on. But you, you manage it. You know, you've got to get data out for prototyping. They're building, running prototype machines out of this. Um, so, so you, you go and do it. And, and, and I did, and it, and it worked great. So I think they, they wanted me to stay on that basis, but I couldn't quite make it work financially because obviously my wife earns and we didn't want to transplant her career into Germany straight away. And my daughter was at a really young age. So it's like, I have to give it a miss. So, and what really did it for me in the end was, was I got a phone call. Um, from a guy called John Piper um, back in the UK saying, how would you like to come and do another land speed record car? And I'm like, yeah, okay. Because I'd worked with John when I was at JCB doing the Diesel Max land speed record car. Um, why the, Why were they asked to do it? 
Why? Why would? Why would? What? 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 Sorry. Why would JCB ask to do the land? They didn't. They car? didn't ask. They they chose to do it. This was this the, the original JCB car was 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 the chairman's vision. The reason why they did it was they'd they'd recently developed a range of their own engines that they wanted to promote to to say these things are really strong and reliable. You know, we're going to be putting them in diggers, but before that. Here they are going 300, 400 mile an hour across the desert. So it was a JCB initiated project, but obviously to make it work, you know, given, given the technical complexities, they needed to get in extra help. So it was still a JCB run thing, but there were a few key engineers that were brought in, including John Piper. Um, we had Richard Noble on board to, to, to manage the project and sort of front it up in that respect. And also a guy called Ron Ayres, who's, who's just Mr. Aerodynamics from the Cold War. He was doing blood down missiles and, and whatever. So anyway, I worked with them to develop the bodywork for JCB's Diesel Max uh, land speed record car, and that, in that all happened. And that were in Alias. That that happened in Alias, um, and that happened while I was still at JCB. Is that uh, sorry? It, is that car in the Transport Museum now? No, the the, the JCB one, the Diesel Max one, is at the world headquarters. But the one that I was then asked to do, Bloodhound SSC, which was the one that is in theory going to do a thousand mile an hour and that's got a rocket fuel booster on it, um, that one is currently in, in Coventry. But I, yeah, I got the call to do that in, must have been 2010, 2009. Yeah, 2009, 2008, 2009. Um, so John picked up the phone and was just like, would you be interested in doing this project? And I'm like, yeah, so he wouldn't tell me exactly what it was over the phone. It's like, you need to come back to Britain and you need to sign an NDA and then we need to have a chat. So it's like, it's always good. Whenever John Piper says, I want to talk to you and you've got to sign an NDA, it's like, yeah, okay, I'm intrigued. So flew home, got the train down to Bristol, had a sit with him, signed a piece of paper and he goes, we're doing another land speed record car. Do you want to be in? And then he filled me in on what it was about. And it was basically the idea of strapping Wing Commander Andy Green to a nuclear missile by the sounds of it and have him hurtle across the desert at literally a thousand mile an hour and I'm like yeah yeah I'm up for that because I mean the, the killer for me was was you know I could do it from home John was like as long as you can come down for meetings you can work from home you're back with your family fine and and that kick-started me as a freelancer that, that kind of gave me the core job which I could then do the Coventry University teaching things alongside ah, and, and okay. freelancing with Nokia down in their Soho studio and, and hustling other clients as well. So I had two and a half years of doing that after JCB won. Tell me about that Nokia studio because I was always very, very intrigued about it because that was like towards the tail end of, of their, 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 their ten years. this, yeah, this, mo- yeah. this mobile phone giant. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it was... For me, it was brilliant because again, it, it, it really taught me the value of digital prototyping and, and rapid prototyping from digital data relentlessly. Um, the studio was great. It was, it was like everything you imagine a design studio should be. Lots of pot plants and people having breakout areas and, but at the heart of it, there's a load of guys working with the sketches, working with the ideas creators. We're, we're crunching the data out and they're printing foam blocks, you know, just, Five at a time overnight and picking up in the morning going, that feels shit, this feels good, that feels shit, this feels great. And just optimizing the physical hand shape of the, of the product and getting it absolutely cock on. And then, and then obviously commissioning full, fully detailed sort of appearance mock-ups and, and stuff like that. And I, to be fair, I was only there about a month, but again, it was just another little sort of penny drop and it's like, yeah, tactile prove out you know that that doing it really quick doing it fast doing it all the time thing and when um, when did really that studio fun. close mike do you know no idea mate I, I was i was literally i was i was i was in and out and by the time i came out of it i was already yeah there was conversations underfoot to get me back into jcb so i, I don't know but I, but given given the history books it wouldn't have been very long after wow and did you was this what did you buy a license at this time yeah, I mean, I, I had a conversation me. with with Magenta, but but it was only Alias Design. It was your base license. It wasn't. I was. I wasn't trying to get into Full Bore Auto Studio, but it was enough. You know, you you've got the tools there. About five five k purchase and eight hundred quid annual renewal for your base license of Alias Design, as it was. So which was affordable. You, so, but what exactly is that? What exactly are you getting for that? What you there's something. That you can't do. There's no explicit control in that. Well, is that there's the- no explicit. There's no explicit control. So, so you're correcting surfaces by hand. You know, you, you're you're building them light, and you're achieving what you want. You still have G two, but you'd have G two with spans in it, 
And if that was an issue for the clients you're working with, you had to manually go in and reparameterize the surface. But for the kind of work we were doing, spans didn't matter. You know, as long as it's G2 and as long as it's tidy and as long as it can go through the engineering package, that was fine. So strategically for me, as a, as a freelancer, as a you know, sole worker, if you like, it was a no-brainer. Let's get it. Let's get on with it. So what happened to that license now? Do you still have it? Still got it. Still got it. But I just didn't bother keeping it up because when I went back to JCB, I had no need for it. So I've still got it. I can still run Alias 2009 or 2010 or whatever it was in perpetuity because it's before all the new licensing things kicked in. So I'll, I can run Alias forevermore, mate. I'm there. I'm bomb-proof. But... The, but, 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 the, but, but there's no functionality in it anymore compared okay. to what there is now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, cool. Um, after that, what what happened then? After that, what happened then? So yeah, did the land speed, did Bloodhound through to full freeze. They've done all the CFD, they've done all the area, they've proved off the surfaces. Uh, got the call to go back to JCB um, because they'd had a... Basically, what happened is over the time that I've been away, they'd had a bit of a recession. They'd let various people go. There'd been changes in management. They were on the way back. Construction industry is very cyclical. It has ups and downs, and yeah, people go, people come back. And Gary called me and, and said, "Well, we, we, we want to get the team back together." It was on. We want to get the team back together. It's like, okay, yeah, cool. Um, but he explained to me that there'd been a change of sort of technical directorship there, and the, and the new guy brought in was making all the right kinds of noises. Guy from Mick Moen, who's sort of ex-Jaguar guy, you know, really, really on the front foot in terms of design and, and the, the place of design. Yeah, his best mate is Ian Callum. So the pair of them rub along together. They know about design and engineering and what the relationship between the two okay. need to be. And so I, I went in for a chat just to go, well, let's sound out what this is all about. Because I didn't want to just go back to essentially what I'd had before. And... I think the, the, the realisation from that conversation was, yeah, the glass ceiling that I'd experienced previously was, yeah, d- down to partially down to the culture, but partially down to how the business was set up. And Mick was talking very much along the lines of restructuring the way that the company was organised, the way it did things, uh, and re- re- restructuring the way design was was used as a tool to, to get leverage, to, to get things right. And it sounded like... Yeah, this is the thing that I've been missing. And, you know, for all, for all my frustrations towards the end of my first time there, I need to be a part of this now because it sounds like all the key things uh, are in place. Okay, so it was They're a completely in place different experience. Yeah, and, 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 and it was different from the front foot because, yeah, we, we were, there was a period of consultation that went on for about 10 months, 12 months in that first year where, where a lot of things about, right, what do we want to do as a, as a department? What do we want to do as a, as a functional team? What are all the sort of technical heads that support everything else, like structures, like electronics, like uh, test and development? What do all these heads of department want the company to be about? How do we want to develop products better in the future? Um, and so after that consultation period, um, they, they they put things in place pretty bloody quickly to uh, to to make it happen, and at the same time that this was all going on, frustratingly enough from my perspective, Gary, my my mentor, my guardian, whatever, um, slipped it into conversation within a month or so of me joining that he was he was potentially going off to a direct competitor. Now within the construction industry, that's pretty frowned on, and. The second he went public with it, he was out. He was gone. He was just like gardening leave, gone. Um, gardening leave. Shut I Dude, just I done. fucking wish just I could done. get some gardening just leave. Just done. I never just got done. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the next thing, I've got Mick on the phone saying, get home, get your suit on, you're going upstairs. And I'm like, right, okay. And this is top floor. You, you go for a conversation with the chairman. And uh, went home, put my suit on, went to see the chairman. And he basically sort of said, well... Um, you're the new global head of design then. What are you going to do about it? And I'm like, right, okay, here we go. Better start wearing a suit and doing something a bit more serious with my life. So, Jesus, um, Mike. So got, you were the big the dick. All of a sudden, I'm the big dick. But, but at the time, the big, the big dick was, was a guy with uh, an, an office that probably wasn't much bigger than this with um, a couple of other people in it. And that was it. You know, that was the design team. That was the industrial design team interfacing with engineers in the business. 
But the yeah, the, the, the brief was grow the team, grow the department, grow the capability, get good, get fucking good and do it really fucking quick because we've got a wave of products that we've got to get on with. So first thing I did was went back to Coventry and hoovered up all the good guys ah, that I'd been talking to previously and mon- mentoring and sponsoring. Into previously. Henry Parnell. No, Henry didn't actually come and join us because he'd actually gone off somewhere else. But it was the guys Fuck from the second. It was guys from the second year. Funnily enough, there is a Henry story. Hen- Henry actually started at JCB as a kid. Did did he tell you that? But in when you talked to him, he well, he mentioned he mentioned you. He mentioned yeah. he mentioned JCB, but I don't. Yeah. I, I I get so, mixed up with it with the competition that he might have. Yeah. Entered. No, Hen- Hen- Henry came to me as as a. And he was basically the age that I was when I first came to JCB, age 12 or whatever, being brought through different departments, getting all this experience. And Henry came and sat with us. And, and, and yeah, he was a bright kid. You just took a shine to him and he took a shine to us. And we've just stayed in touch ever since. So I did see Henry. He was in the first of the two-year groups that I did at COV. Uh, and I'm still in sort of regular WhatsApp chats with Henry almost sort of two, three times a week now. But um, no, Henry wasn't there. But, but I got... Um, Sam Payne, Toby Meller, um, Ben Heron, they all came through. Tom Underhill came to us, who's now um, doing big things in Jaguar Land Rover. They were all sort of graduates that hoovered up and was like, right, off we go. Let's go do a thing. And there, there was myself and Sam Gilbert sort of being the grown-ups in the team, if you like, but even then we're only early 30s, whatever. And uh, given this stupendous mission to, to just get on and overhaul the entire product range at a time when everything in the company needed to change. Um, because basically th- th- there's a whole load of emissions legislation that comes through and, and within the construction industry, it's getting more and more stringent year on year. And it got to the point where you're into tier four interim and tier four final in terms of diesel particulate filters being added and all kinds of stuff like that. And basically what that meant was you couldn't get an engine to fit in any of the machines that JCB currently made. And you didn't have any of the control functionality in the cab, the displays, the hardware, the ECUs to display any of the information that you need to convey to do it. So basically what JCB had to do, like many other people in the industry, is rip up their entire range in one go and rebuild it. And we were there for that. It was awesome. Jesus, wow. It's fucking mental, but awesome. (laughs) That is is pretty insane. And how long were you there for, Mark? I did, in that second stint, I must have done sort of five and a half years. Um, but it was mad because aside from just the machines, the, the, the key thing that we did was we got, and it's, and it's been on YouTube, JSP have promoted it quite heavily, although it is sort of a secret environment. They, they built what they call the Innovation Centre, which is this dedicated sort of cross-functional environment where you've got industrial design, you've got visiting engineers coming in at the sort of the seeding stage of the project, where you've only got two or three, but they're the key personnel that will take it all the way through. You've got a massive power wall where you're doing almost weekly reviews of everyone's projects. You've got all the technical specialists upstairs that can advise on structures, electronics, yada, 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 legislation. And it's just this melting pot, you know, this this product sheet dip where you're just in there, it's super intense, but you're getting it done. And as a facility, that's something JCB hadn't had before, that one central space where everyone just focused and um, it was great because I mean you could cover a lot of ground really quickly and, and again you, you'd be able to cross fertilise from multiple projects at the same time and some projects were strategically brought through the department together because there was a lot of shared DNA within them there was a lot of shared interior architecture or hardware or body panels or whatever so brilliant, absolutely amazing you, you, you got to really do a thorough job in a very short space of time Mike, we're um, on the subject of like presenting and talking and um, communicating. Um, did you feel out of depth at all when you moved into that fancy position? Uh, I, I didn't when it came to where we are now, you know, being able to talk about what's happened. Um, but in the early days, I did found it really difficult because you, because because you couldn't talk about what you were doing directly. You're, you're talking to dealerships, you're talking to all sorts of people, but you can't show them. You can't just go, here's the design, here you are, because it's still in gestation. And you sort of, you're hinting at things. It's all a bit smoke and mirrors. And, and I didn't really enjoy that because I'm, yeah, I'm very hands-on. You know, it's, it's here. This is what it is. Um, so that's sort of blah, 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 talking around design rather than directly to the point, here it is, here's the thing. I, I found, yeah 
awkward and, and a little bit like you're selling something that isn't there. And, and we knew it was all coming, but it was like, it's not quite real yet. And, and I think, you know, historically, you know, there, there's maybe been JCB stuff where, yeah, there has been a lot of talk, but people, the customers, they're going, yeah, but we want to see the product. We really want to see it. And more than anything, I wanted to be able to show it to them, but you, you couldn't because it wasn't ready. And it's like, Arr! so yeah, that, that was, that was frustrating, but. I think the thing that I found more frustrating than anything was just the sheer amount of time that kind of activity did take up. Um, between that and obviously the managerial responsibilities, because because my my role wasn't in theory it was about guiding the team, but it was also to to get it really right, being that interface with all the other departments, with all the other disciplines, to make it really really come together and work well. So I found that I was increasingly spending less and less time in the studio, less and less time on design myself. And, you know, you're in that situation where you just, you feel like you're just drifting away from what it is you want, where you're, what it is you're good at. And you, you're aware there's great stuff going on, but you're not able to really, you know, really own it. And, and that was the bit that, you know, always fired me up, that I was always most passionate about. So I, I ended up feeling, yeah, a bit disconnected, a bit disjointed, and a bit, and a bit like, so, well, what am I doing here? This, I can see that this role is working for everyone else, but... I'm not getting what I want out of it. And, but on and on the subject of like pr- just presenting like big projects and stuff to to senior members of uh, the board or or um, you know other fancy people, are you are you generally pretty okay with that? Yeah, I mean, I was I was really lucky because it, because it's family run, yeah, because it's it's a family run business. There's there's a there's a lot of people there, but there's only a very few people you really need to worry about. Um, in as much as the chairman himself is is so passionate about product, so passionate about vehicles, so passionate about design. You know, he, he's he's got an eye for it himself. You know, in, in another life, he could, he's, he's he could do anything, but he could he could I'm sure he could go and train and be a designer and be amazing at it because he's got that kind of eye. So I always found in conversation, I'd just be me. I'd just be talking like I am now, and and you know, you're mindful that you know there's all this official etiquette that you're talking to a guy who's super up here and he's running this company and he's doing this and he's in the Sunday Times 100 rich list and all that and and I'm just like it's this it's that and he's like yeah fair play because I because I think to be honest he he needs people that are straight with him you know and and, and just and just talk honestly and okay I'm blah, 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 going and he's like just 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 talk slowly just hang on but, but he'd listen and he, and he'd always be a you know, huge support and a, and a huge you know, sort of pillar of strength you could draw from, and it, and it, and if and if you got it right, and if he was happy with it, that was it. That was all you really need to do. And as long as it, you know, met the criteria, it satisfied the other various stakeholders up to that point. You know, your your immediate peers. As long as you got that right, if he gives it the green light, oh, that's you're fine. It. Okay, you're well, fine. And, and 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 to be fair, you know, we just got to the point where you know. I wouldn't say there was just automatic trust. You know, that he still wants to be in the room. He still wants to see it for himself, but. There wasn't really much he ever really kicked off about that we did, you know, because I think we just reached that simpatico really quickly, and he was just there going, "Yeah, fine." And, and you would keep him in the loop. We'd send him packs. We'd sit down. We'd do quarterly briefings with him. We'd running through everything that's going on, and if there was anything he wasn't sure about or or took a dislike to, we could address it really early doors. But there, but there was no more of this presenting it on a Friday and it all being shit. And you've got to do it again for next Tuesday. It was like, no, it was all very smooth. You know, it was very clear comms both ways and and as a result of that things yeah did work very well 